Eric Darling here with Darling Data. And uh, I got, got a nice email from someone in uh, Microsoft Customer Support Services. That's Microsoft CSS. For those acronym-loving folks playing along at home, thanking me for uh, my open source scripts because apparently they were able to use them to help them, trouble, help them troubleshoot an issue today. So from here on out, I'm just going to say that my scripts are Microsoft Customer Support Services approved or CSS approved, Microsoft CSS approved, at least until the lawyers catch up with me, in which, at which time I'll, uh, I'll fight a lawyer live on TV. It'll be like uh, Musk vs. Zuckerberg, except everyone will be rooting for me instead. <laughs> so uh, this the purpose of this video in celebration of my recent, uh, my recent accolades from Microsoft is to sort of reintroduce SP pressure detector. And the reason that I want to do that is because I realized uh, I was looking at my GitHub repo <clears throat> and uh, what I saw was something that I had forgotten about <laughs> ages ago is that uh, my GitHub repo has a readme file. And that readme file was hopelessly out of date and uh, sort of a bit malnourished looking. So I spent a lot of time redoing the readme file to document as much stuff as I possibly could in there. And uh, I was rather happy with it, much happier than I am currently with uh, my green screen, which is showing sporadic shadowing. I guess I've got to stand a little bit closer to you. Hope you don't mind. Hope I don't smell too bad. It's Friday. You know what happens on Fridays. Uh, <clears throat> deadlifts happen on Fridays. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the best place to start with any of my scripts is uh, with the help parameter. Uh, let me actually make this a little bit, make this a little bit bigger so it's a little bit more readable. Like, like putting a query inside of a common table expression. I'm going to zoom in so it's more readable. Right? So uh, the best place to start with any of my store procedures, if you're unsure how to use them, if you're unsure about what the parameters are or what they do, is to use the at help parameter. It is a very carefully designed set of information to help you get the most out of my free, open source, Microsoft approved store procedures. Uh, I usually start off with a little introduction, right? tell you kind of what the purpose of the script is, what it does. I don't like anyone to feel like they're left in the dark about the, the intent of the script. And then uh, some scripts have a little bit more in them than others. Uh, the more complicated ones like SP Human Events and SP Quickie Store will have some example uh, executions in there. But this one, so usually I don't, I don't have to mess with, 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 uh, with, with settings too much or parameters too much in this one. It's pretty good to just run right out of the box. But I do realize uh, using this, after using the scripts live for like client troubleshooting and for training that sometimes it would behoove me to uh, add a little bit of uh, configurability in there so that there's less sort of jumping around and things. So they're mostly there for me. <laughs> Except for one thing, which is there for a nice person who left a YouTube or blog comment about uh, the CPU utilization threshold, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. So uh, <clears throat> this section here will tell you uh, what the parameters available for the store procedure are and uh, what a reasonable uh, value is to set that parameter to and also what the default values are. So uh, what to check will uh, define if you want to check for everything or just CPU pressure or just memory pressure. Uh, if you want to skip looking at queries that are currently executing on the server, you can use that. If your server is under such duress that uh, getting query plans back causes hangups with SP pressure detector. You can skip getting plan XML in the, in the queries that get executing queries. Uh, if you want to, so minimum disk latency applies to the section of the code that goes and looks at the uh, DM virtual file stats, <coughs> DMV, and uh, 
you can you can set your own custom latency there. By default, I look for disks that or files that have uh, over a hundred millisecond read or write latency, which I think is pretty f a fair starting place to look at for things that might be uh, not great with disks. But you can set that higher or lower depending on your needs. Uh, the second one down here is a CPU utilization utilization threshold. Now, in the in the full result set, there are some XML clickable columns, and there are two of them that have to deal with CPU. One of them goes out to uh, this funny little set of XML that records CPU utilization in SQL Server, and in there there, there was there used to be a hard coded filter of fifty uh, for looking at. Uh, for getting data out of these XML bits for when uh, CPU utilization passed a certain point, this is now configurable. So if you want to bump it up to 70 or 80 or 90, depending on, you know, um, depending on what your, what your server is used to running at, some folks are awesome. And they realize that if their, their CPUs are consistently spinning under 30%, that they are probably giving Microsoft too much money unless they have some like occasional workload bits that just fly off the handle and push things up to 100%, which is fine. You, know, you just know that most of the time you're paying Microsoft too much. Um, so there's that. So if you want to only look for when CPU is over 80% or over 90%, then you are, you are free to use that parameter to do that. Uh, there's also an option here to skip the section of SP pressure detector uh, that, that looks at weight stats. Um, especially if you need to sort of run this like rapid fire and like, you know, see when and where things are changing, you might not want to look at weight stats every single time, right? Because like, like weight stats might not change that much over like the, the, the second and a half that, you, uh, that you, you wait between executions. And on top of that, um, you probably won't remember all the numbers anyway, unless you're paying very specific attention to one. So. Those are the parameters and a full explanation of the parameters. This is, of course, fully free MIT license. And if you go over to the messages tab, you'll see the full MIT license when you enter the help section. So I'm not going to execute this with every single different parameter. I'm just going to execute this with everything so that I can walk through all of the different sections in here. Now, uh, my laptop hasn't been up to a whole lot lately, which is OK. You know, I've been busy with stuff. I don't, I don't have 24 hours a day to, to, to write and run demo workloads on here. Uh, but this first section up here will uh, show you the weight stats that I consider important for performance. There are a whole list of other ones. Sometimes they're useful to look at. Sometimes they're not. SP Pressure Detector focuses in on a few very specific areas of weight stats around parallelism, CPU, uh, disk, memory, and blocking. Uh, so those are, the, those are the sections that I focus on because those are the sections that represent pressure for SQL Server. Uh, in, in this section, uh, you're, you'll see hours uptime. That's how long your server has been up. You'll also see hours of CPU time. Uh, this is only available in Enterprise Edition at the moment. Um, and I was going to say something important here. Yeah, uh, Standard Edition is kind of a, kind of a waste. If you're, on, if you're on standard edition, you might as well just be using Postgres. It's kind of funny. Uh, there's the weight type uh, for all of the ones that we're interested in. Uh, there's a description of the weights in there. So if you're not sure what a weight is, there's a description column. You have how many hours we've waited on that weight. Uh, it's useful to compare this to... Uh, uh, total uptime and total CPU time. So if your server is in a crazy 24-7 workload, uh, it might be a little bit more, it might be a little best, like your server's, look at server's been up for like 3,000 hours, but you only have like 1,000 hours of CPU time, uh, then it's usually a little bit more, uh, usually a little bit more wise from a performance analysis point of view to compare uh, hours wait time to hours CPU time and hours uptime. If your server is just constantly flying off the rails, then uh, hours uptime and hours wait time are pretty good to compare each other to. We get the hours of signal wait time. I don't put a percentage in there because I've never found it terribly useful. Either the numbers are close or they're not. Uh, for SOS scheduler yield, they'll pretty much always be one-to-one. -one. There might be slight differences in there, but 
uh, the most part, um, the, 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 out, the, the timing for schedule yield would be the timing for the, the, the wait time. The hours of wait time on schedule yield would be pretty even with the hours of signal wait time. Uh, we have how many tasks have waited on that wait, and then the average milliseconds per wait. Now, where this, this, is, this is useful because we want to know, uh, you know, the number of tasks that waited on something, fine, but we also want to know on average, was there a lot of latency in waiting for that? This can be particularly useful with lock waits, so we know ballpark how long queries are waiting to get locks on average. The next section down is hours of uptime. Uh, hours of uptime. And I just read the column name. I injected a word in there too. This section is the one I was talking about with the virtual file stash, which virtual file stash which has the parameter where you can set the latency number for it. Uh, I pick, I came back with a whole bunch of tempdb files in here. Then they, you can see the average write stall on those was over 100 milliseconds. So that's why these got picked up. If I change that parameter to be a lower number, I might see some other stuff in here. The read stall on the on the file is fine. The write stall, you know, it is what it is. Tempdb. Unless, unless this is like in the seconds all the time, I'm not going to worry too much about it. All, all sorts of stuff uses tempdb. You don't know when these averages sort of got driven up. It could be checkdb. It could be you know some weird one-off event that will never happen again. You just It's impossible to tell without digging deeper. Uh, there's also the total amount of data in gigabytes read and written, the total read and write count, and that's about the end of it there. Um, I don't spend too, too much time talking about disk. <clears throat> um, unless you're in uh, some platform as a service offering in Azure, where uh, you were recently forced to, uh, to wash Microsoft's feet because uh, they, they gave you uh, transaction log throughput equivalent to uh, uh, an SD card from 2003 plugged into an SD card reader plugged into like a USB-A port, 200 megs a second. Uh, then I'll talk a lot about incomplete thoughts that are very expensive. Next section down is a clickable. If you want to get some basic information about tempdb, it'll tell you how many files you have, the min and max size of each file. So if, if you have one file that's like a gig, or like if there's one, if the min size is like a gig and the max size is like 20 gigs, you might need to do some adjusting there. Uh, the growth increment in gigabytes and the uh, total number of CPUs you have. So you get a sense of if the number of data files you have lines up with the number of schedulers you have on the server. Uh, there's also in some information about uh, space used in TempDB, uh, how much is free which is taken up by user objects, version store objects, and then internal objects, and then what the current TempDB activity is. So if there's a session using TempDB, um, then we will get information about that back, along with some other information about the size of the allocations. I, don't, I tend not to go below gigs in here because like 800 megs is just not sufficient for me to worry about. This is not, not doing it for me. Next section down is memory consumers. So um, <clears throat> all the things in SQL Server that may consume memory, the buffer pool, uh, different caches, query memory grants, that'll all show up in here. You'll get this top line, which will show you the buffer pool. You'll have this second line, which will show you how much memory has been stolen from the buffer pool. And then the next section down is sort of the top five. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't even have five additional things in here right now. Uh, I only have four, I think. Well, well let's count that. Let's Squint one, two, three, four. I do have five. I did it. Check me out, Mom. So uh, I do have five in here, and uh, these are pretty small, but they are the they are ordered by which five have the highest memory consumption. Next section down, uh, we'll grab XML to show if uh, any if SQL Server was reporting any low memory conditions. Sometimes worth looking into those if your server is deemed to be under memory pressure, um, seeing, you know, lots of resource semaphore weights, resource semaphore query compile, which I'll show you in the wait stats up top. Or if, uh, you, you, if you have a lot of page IO latch weights, you might see that uh, you, you, might, you might find that your server is under pretty consistent memory pressure uh, because you are constantly swapping data 
in between uh, RAM and disk. <clears throat> the next section down will give you some information about, uh, well, a few different things. Uh, it'll give you the total database size. It'll give you how much physical memory is in the server. It'll give you what max server memory is set to. I have mine dropped down a little bit right now because I was trying to show like lower memory conditions. 96 gigs fits a lot of the Stack Overflow 2013 database in it. So this is uh, brought down a little bit lower so I could, could, could cheat a little bit in that demo. Don't tell anyone. Uh, it'll tell you if you have locked pages and memory enabled, which is a setting I highly recommend especially on servers with more than 64 gigs of memory in them. So it's a generally a pretty good idea to have that in there. But you bypass all sorts of virtual addr memory address space and go right to allocating physical memory. It's a pretty handy setting, I think. Um, also seen it prevent non-yielding schedulers in a lot of in, in some recent cases too, where uh, schedulers were getting all mixed up and messed up because of the constant swapping between disk and memory. Having locked pages and memory enabled magically fix that. Uh, you'll get some information about uh, target server memory, how much memory SQL Server uh, likes, how much SQL Server wants, uh, how much total memory we have available, how much memory we have in total, sorry, uh, how much memory we have available. Right. So this is uh, how much memory we have available to loan out to queries for query memory grants. Right, it's about 75% of your max server memory setting. Uh, this is how much we've granted out this, uh, to queries. Uh, nothing running on my server right now, but you know, if there were, you might see some memory grants getting dished out and doled out, and you might see that get populated. Uh, we have how much the queries have used out of that grant. Over here, we have slightly different stuff. So this, is how many this would be how many queries have been granted memory grants. This would be how many queries we have waiting to be granted a memory grant. If there have been any timeout errors, if there have been any forced grants, SQL Server can sometimes force queries to run with a lower memory grant. That's that serial desired memory uh, uh, part of the, the query plan. Uh, the total reduced memory count. So how many times queries have been forced to run with a... Uh, a reduced grant, which is strangely five when this is zero. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe, maybe I did. Maybe I had a demo that went behind the scenes and messed something up there. I don't know. I have like min grant percent does something with that. Uh, this section down here, well, not too many fireworks. If there were something running asking for a memory grant, that would show up in here, which my server is blessedly slow right now because it's Friday. Friday, as some folks say. Uh, this is the section that I was talking about with the CPU details. All right, so uh, if we look in here, uh, we'll get some information about what our CPU configuration looks like. You'll notice that offline CPUs is right at the top. If you have installed the wrong version of SQL Server that can only use 20 cores, or if you have terribly misconfigured your standard edition VM uh, for SQL Server to use like one socket per core for 8, 12, 16 sockets and a whole bunch of CPU cores are offline. I want that to be f the top of the list there. The rest of this is just sort of stuff that's, that I can get. So uh, I decided to, to, to keep it nice and informational in this, in this, uh, this output. Um, this CPU utilization column, uh, this is the one that I talked about having the parameter for up here a little bit. Uh, that's the CPU utilization threshold. If you want this to be higher or lower than 50, you can now configure that via the magic of parameters. Uh, down here is general state information about your CPUs, how many total threads you have, how many are currently used, how many you have available, uh, how many threads are, I think, waiting for CPU is an important one, how many requests are waiting for threads is a good one to look at, how many workers are currently active, uh, the total active request count. It's another good one to keep an eye on. See these numbers all jumping up together. We can be reasonably sure that our, our server is getting pretty well hammered on CPU. Uh, if you have any requests that are stuck waiting for things, this will this will show up with a with a with a number in it. Uh, if how many queries are block, how many tasks are currently blocked will show up in there. Uh, how many active parallel threads you have. Uh, and then these last two columns are, if you have a lot, if you have like, let's say 20 queries running and five of them are 
pegging away at CPU, and 15 of them are, so like those five queries are running, and then you have like 15 queries that are runnable, that'll show up here, and that's a pretty good way to figure out if you have CPU pressure on your server. So that's, that's queries like, I want, I, I'm ready to use a CPU, but I, I can't use a CPU because every, everyone else is, I'm at the back of this line here. Like they're, they're going to see Taylor Swift and they're, they're the last ones to show up and they're just in the back of the parking lot, like hoping, hoping that someday they'll get inside. Uh, if there are any current thread pool weights on the server, they will show up in here. This is uh, much spicier when there's a demo involved. But in this, right now, there's, there's no demo involved, so we, we don't have anything. But um, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that uh, SQL Server does not, like when it spins up, you get a certain number of worker threads based on how many CPUs you have, unless you override that by being goofy, changing the default setting. Uh, but this, if, like SQL Server doesn't create 506 worker threads and then leave them there. SQL Server, SQL Server will grow and trim the worker thread set as, thing, as, as it needs. Um, so you might see some thread pool weights, as long as they're relatively short, I'm not too, too concerned. Like if there are like three or four in there that have been waiting for like a few milliseconds, I'm not worked up. But if I start seeing queries waiting like 100, 500, like a full second to get worker threads to run on, that's when I start to get a little bit more nervous. And then down here, this final section, uh, if there were anything fun running on here, we would see a bunch of uh, queries ordered by, well, not ordered by, but a bunch of queries with uh, CPU usage down here. We get query text, query plans, how long they've been running, uh, a bunch of, bunch of useful stuff, a bunch of useful metrics about the, the queries. Uh, that's a nice graphical bug in SSMS over there. You can't really see it. I'm gonna, wait, wait. I went the right way first time. Yep, look at all. Oh, green screen. What have you done to me? Let's just lean in here. Have a little chat, you and I. This is how I stand at the bar. Just lean on an elbow. Why I'm very popular. But uh, that's nice. Graphical glitches. The mess. What is all that mess? <sighs> Maybe it's not SSMS's fault. Maybe it's me. Maybe SSMS just wants to have nice forehead wrinkles like I do. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Anyway, uh, that is the basic output that you will get from SP Pressure Detector. If you uh, see anything here that you have questions about, you want to head over to my GitHub repo, code.ericdarlingdata.com. That will get you... Uh, it's a short, short URL to my, uh, to my GitHub repo where you can uh, ask me questions. If you email me a question, I'm going to tell you to go use GitHub. Because then everyone can see it. You can really think hard about the question you're asking before you ask it. It's, a lot, it's really easy to send an, a private email to someone and ask questions that, that may not look good in the light of day. You might think really hard about the question you're asking. You might, you might find yourself starting to write something and then realizing you can go investigate things a little bit on your own. Keep in mind that since these store procedures are all completely open source, completely available to you, free for download, even Microsoft customer support is free to download and use them, uh, you can read through all of the code and you can see exactly what it does and you can Try to figure some stuff out for yourself. You might, even, you might even be super nice and kind and open up a pull request with a contribution of your own. I'm very grateful for the folks out there who do that. Anyway, this was a reintroduction to SP Pressure Detector, all in one video, kind of short and sweet. At least I tried to make it short and sweet. We'll see how we did. Uh, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. If you, if you like the video, well, hit that little thumbs up button down there. It uh, always makes me feel joyful inside when, uh, when people like my videos. Uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you like this video quite a bit, you can even subscribe to my channel so you get notified when I, when I release new ones, which I try to do, well, I try to do pretty often. Schedule, 
schedule's been a little weird lately. Summer vacation, travel, kids, uh, work. So I haven't been able to record quite as much as I wanted to, but I do it as much as I can. Anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, th again, thank you for watching, and I will see you over in the next video where I will talk about something else entirely.